So maybe you could just talk about what led you to become a Democrat. Uh, early, early on, uh, my values were one of uh, civil rights, social inclusion. Uh, my family uh, or our immigrants uh, to this country, they came separately uh, from Taiwan in the 1950s, uh, born in New York, raised in the south suburbs of Chicago. We were the first Asian American family. Our community uh, was not very integrated, and so as a first Asian American family, we faced a lot of hostility, uh, bigotry, discrimination. We were treated as second-class citizens. Uh, this was in the 1960s, and so I used to watch uh, people like Martin Luther King on TV. Mm -hmm. And so uh, when you thought about people who are fighting for more inclusion, uh, later became affiliated uh, with the Democrats. And so that's uh, early on why I became a Democrat. Was your entire family Democratic, or is that a decision that you made? Uh, that was, uh, my mom was uh, passionately Demo Democratic. My dad was a uh, lean Republican. Uh, my mom won the naming war. I'm named after John F. Kennedy. My brother's named after Robert Kennedy. If uh, my dad had his way, I would have been named Richard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what's the most difficult thing you've had to do in your life? Uh, overcome the struggle of loss. Uh, watching my dad pass away too soon. Uh, the, I think for all of us, uh, you want the people that you love and who are dear to you uh, to have good lives. My dad did the right things. Uh, sacrifice, struggle, overcame, uh, wasn't easy for him. Faced a lot of uh, health hardships, which led to some financial challenges. And then uh, clearly the passing of my sister. Uh, she was the person I was closest to on this planet. Uh, the kids are, uh, the letters of our names are J.R. J.R. They didn't continue with the Kennedy naming, but it was Joyce and Roger. Uh, there was an eight and ten year gap between uh, me and Joyce and Roger. My mom wanted to make sure all four kids were close, so she said if you were going to go out, uh, you had to bring your little brother and sister. So my sister and I shared a lot of the same passions. We went to the same law school. Uh, she went to work at the INS. She worked for Congressman Howard Berman. Uh, and so to have her murdered uh, is obviously very devastating. I'm wondering, is, is there a, a political issue that you have changed your mind about in your life? Uh, from one side to the other, I, I, you, you, make, uh, you make some gradations on issues and how to, uh, how to achieve things. Uh, no, but you know, uh, my issues uh, in the 20 years of public service have been upward economic and social mobility. How to best achieve that may change over a period of time, but uh, from civil rights, social inclusion to uh, basic economic issues, uh, you know, at its very core, it's the same. Mm. So, there's, so there's no one particular issue where you know, back in your 20s you used to believe one thing and now you've you sort of change your mind? No, in my, in my 20s, while I was at the University of South Florida, I protested the student aid cuts uh, uh, that Ronald Reagan was proposing, and I was uh, protesting South Africa, so I definitely didn't change my mind on those issues. Okay, fair enough. Um, you sort of developed a reputation over the course of your career in, in this campaign as someone who's uh, running on your record as a, an experienced and hardworking and competent. What do you do for fun? Oh, uh, I used to play basketball. Uh, I have eight godchildren, uh, so I spent time with my godchildren. was at their, uh, the twins' uh, birthday party. They turned seven on Saturday in the San Gabriel Valley. I uh, like to go out and catch movies, uh, like to read, uh, love to swim, to live in a complex that is a, it's a, there's a community pool. So uh, my form of breathing and relaxation is uh, going out and swimming laps. You said you like to read. Um, if you could recommend one book to every Californian, what would it be? Uh, I don't know for every single Californian because everybody has a difference, right? The, uh, I'm reading the, uh, at this moment, the time, I uh, forgot what it, the author, but the person who would uh, write the, uh, basically uh, share the prayers for the day for uh, President Obama. Mm -hmm. So, you know, those quick little snippets provide inspiration on a, a daily basis mm -hmm. and provides a little bit of a context. Mm -hmm. You moved to, when did you move to California? 1987. Okay. Um, what do you think the rest of the country gets wrong about California? Uh, well, the, I, I remember at my law school table, and I don't want to out them, uh, but you know, they said it's the land of fruit and nuts, uh, <laughs> right? And here's this uh, Boston Bruins uh, big fan from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, right? You know, they think we're a little soft. Uh, 
I'm not sure they would think as much uh, anymore, uh, but uh, we're, we're the state of incredible inclusion, opportunity. Uh, I, my, my friends from suburban Chicago where I grew up didn't understand how anybody could leave Chicago, right? Great pride, and, but I brought them out to talk, and talk to them um, uh, shared experiences. We went to a Latino event and there was Ricardo Montalban. And when you grow up in an era where you had uh, Ricardo Montalban and, you know, and say the plane, the plane, and, uh, and he ac actually got to see him when we went out to Pepperdine and we played uh, touch football on the, on the meadows and had barbecue, uh, they understood the, uh, some of the attractions about California. So there wasn't that fierce resistance. Uh, they still had their incredible pride, as I do, about uh, Chicago. Uh, but you know, you can grow a greater love. And for me, there's uh, there's no place for better opportunity and meeting people from all across the globe than uh, the place I call home. Okay, great. Well, on that note, uh, we'll move. The high housing prices, the feeling that they can't get ahead. The you know, uh, it's a national issue, but obviously we have the highest poverty rate in the country, we, our income inequality is uh, wider than the, the nation. Uh, and I think, you know, I, the question, and it's a broad one, but what, did California make this problem even worse than it is nationally? Or, and, and what are the two things you would do, or the state could do, and you would do as governor to respond to these issues? Yeah, it is a deep problem, but it's not an intractable problem. Uh, we know that, uh, as you pointed out, uh, we have extraordinary wealth inequality in some of the communities that they say we don't have that wealth inequality, it's because some of those who are in the lower income strata have frankly left those communities. Uh, the things, we have to get back at, at our core to being excellent at the basics. Uh, one of the things we have to celebrate, uh, but also understand the opportunities, uh, some would label them challenges, is we need to make sure regardless of circumstance, regardless of background, regardless of income, every child needs to get a world-class education. Even guaranteeing great education does not, make sure, uh, does not guarantee uh, that somebody's gonna be economically successful. Uh, we saw during that last recession, 2008, 2009, as I was uh, visiting the Silicon Valley, it would go to technology, engineering gatherings. You had individuals who had master's degrees, who had PhDs, who were unemployed uh, because you had larger factors in play. But you're simply not going to be competitive unless you have a great education. We just know that skill set uh, to compete in a global economy requires all of that. And so one of the things I would push aggressively is uh, investment in education. But what I've also pushed uh, equally as aggressively is to make sure that we have accountability in our system. Uh, I'm the most successful auditor in California history having identified $9.5 billion of government uh, waste inefficiencies, uh, fraud. Uh, we need to make sure that we, uh, we also have ownership, right? My theory about schools is that you, uh, have, you need school site leadership, top to bottom, from the principal, vice principal, the teachers, uh, school employees, and then what's also measured on the dashboard, you need to make sure you have parental involvement. So, uh, and we'll get some education questions coming up, but especially on accountability, what is the state's role in being responsible for the performance at K-12 schools? Yeah, that's, the state has to make sure that, right, that there's an independent uh, authority that is gonna work with the local school districts uh, if they're, they're not demonstrating a measurable improvement. Uh, we know there are many metrics uh, to that improvement. Uh, we know people start off behind, uh, so they may not reach the same achievement levels. At the end of the day, they have to be at the same achievement levels. However, right, if they're making remarkable growth, let's not penalize them because somebody starts off dramatically behind, right? They, you, we also have to do a better job in regards to accessing and securing data, right? We have too many kids who live in families that are food insecure, that are housing insecure. A uh, year ago plus when I met with the CEO of Valley Children's Hospital, he was mentioning how there are three schools in the Fresno School District where over 50% of the kids are homeless, uh, right? To, to lay upon uh, teachers uh, to make sure that, uh, you know, have them fully responsible for that child's uh, academic achievement, uh, right, may be not fully placed accurately, right? Obviously the teacher has a role and responsibility, but if that child's food insecure, that's housing secure, trying to battle to make sure that they get to school, right? We need a comprehensive effort to make sure that we, we do what our fundamental tenet and responsibility is to make sure that children do well. And I, I was looking for two things that respond to the issue. Education was one, and what's a- Housing. 
Housing. Housing, okay. right. So uh, we'll, we'll follow up with uh, that uh, with uh, some more questions, yeah. too. So, uh, Clearly, uh, you know, we've, we've fallen dramatically behind. One and a half million units short, uh, right? It's a, it's a, it's a sum of uh, many of the uh, failures, omissions, uh, to take the actions that are needed. Uh, right today, I chair TCAC and SIDLAC. I sit on three of the state's four housing authorities. Uh, you know, one of my inaugurals, if you go back uh, and see one of the things that I said I was going to focus on was uh, increasing the financing for affordable housing in the state of California. My first year as a treasurer, I worked, uh, my staff uh, met with uh, the builders, the representatives, uh, to make sure that we try to redesign some of the rules and regulations at TCAC and SIDLAC. And, by year two, we had a over 80% increase in the f amount of financing for new and rehabilitated housing. Now, admittedly, it's over a small base, but you have to demonstrate, which had not been done before, progress in regards to this front, right? You, if you keep heading in the right direction, right, you can build momentum, you can build participation. There were a lot of people who were frustrated because they said, you, we didn't see activity, we didn't see leadership from the federal government, we didn't see it from the state. In fact, during some of that financial crisis, and we understood why it was done, right? We took away the principal source of funding for local governments to build affordable housing. So we need to rebuild that, and we're starting to see uh, some action as, as of the last legislative year between uh, you know, a whole host of authors and the governor moving forward, but it is not enough uh, at the moment. So we need to make sure that we continue to uh, add, add strengthen the foundation and uh, build the houses. Mm -hmm. So perfect, perfect, perfect segue. So I have, I have a few more housing questions for sure. you. Sure. I'm just going to move your mic. Yeah, she's doing Rubbing. that. What's Tidlack and Sidlack? Oh, okay. It's the Tax Credit Allocation Committee and the California Debt Limit Allocation Committee. So the uh, TCAC uh, handles the tax credits when you build a lot of the housing. Uh, there's a 9% bond, which are more valuable than and the 4%, I'm sorry, 9% tax credit. And the 4% tax credit, there's a, you also handle, SIDLAC handles uh, the debt allocation. Uh, so you'll get incentives based on per capita uh, federal contributions and you will allocate it for different economic activities. Uh, one of the major categories that we provide here is for housing uh, in the state of California. There would have been massive implications uh, last year. Uh, some of you might have followed it. Trump's tax reform plan. Bingo, right? They, thank you for knowing and paying attention, right? So, so, many, peop, so many people don't. Right, the, uh, I held a press conference with San Diego builders. Right, the, that's, that's the difference, I think, in being able to provide leadership, having actually an understanding of how programs work. Uh, up until then, we had pushed, we, we had a backlog of, of unused tax credits uh, when I got to uh, the authorities of $4 billion. Prior to then, uh, in working aggressively with the agencies, we pushed out three of the four <coughs> billion. Uh, actually, at the end of uh, last year, we were fully subscribed because uh, if that House plan was going to be successful and the Senate picked it up, right, we would have lost that opportunity. Uh, the tax exemption on private activity bonds helps finance 66 percent of the affordable housing in the state of California. So we said, uh, let's not waste uh, this opportunity. So I would, I would love to talk about LIHTC all day with you um, <laughs> another time. Um, <laughs> but let me, let me get a couple other housing questions in here. So there's a chance after November that rent control could be dramatically expanded across California. Would that be a good thing or a bad thing for California's housing crisis? Uh, rent control, I think, to a certain extent would be helpful in the short term. Uh, the, right, there's a balance with uh, what we're looking to do because obviously when you look at a lot of the economic studies, uh, rent control uh, uh, preserves housing for those who are currently in there, right? But there are challenges for developers who want to expand it, uh, right? The, uh, they don't see the financial incentives. Uh, depending on how it's priced, they don't feel like putting reinvestment into those particular units and upgrading. So uh, obviously we don't want to see, as we've witnessed, despite some of the laws that are in place, as we witness uh, probably more so uh, in recent cases than others, where people were displaced after the, uh, the wildfires uh, in Napa, right? And so some changes were going to be made and people were going to increase, as reported, 3,000, 4,000 uh, percent. We don't want that outrageous, outlandish conduct uh, to be able to persist. Uh, so I think we need clarification and uh, better definition. What, what limits would you place on what cities could do with rent control? 
uh, the, uh, I would look at, uh, you know, perhaps for a short period of time, I don't want to do anything permanent because we do have a housing shortage, right? Rent control, I think, is, uh, you know, a act in the larger question of the lack of affordable housing in the state. So is there something that we can do intermediately as part of uh, a comprehensive plan to try to make housing more accessible and affordable uh, in this next next decade. But what, are there like specific limits that you would say cities you can't do this when it comes to rent control? Uh, I would uh, I I would I, I want to have that conversation. Uh, the okay. uh, I don't want to have a state dictate. Uh, you know, obviously markets are different throughout the state. I want to be responsive. Uh, some of the things that I've tried to do and the authorities that I've sit on is to provide a menu of options, uh, recognizing. Uh, you want local participants to be able to have a voice, to be able to participate in their democracy. They have duly elected representatives. Uh, let's make sure that democratic process actually works. Um, do you support reforming Prop 13? And if so, how? Uh, yes, I would reform the abuses in Prop 13. Uh, the, when it was passed in 1978, we know uh, you trigger a reassessment when you have a transfer of 50% uh, plus one. Uh, or, right, or you trigger partial reassessment if you have substantial improvements to those properties. Uh, we know that people, because of brilliant tax lawyers and accountants, have been able to avoid uh, that reassessment. Uh, you know, step transactions, uh, partial transfers, but when you aggregate it, it's over 50%. So I would support if you aggregate all those transactions uh, and they. Uh, and it's new, right? You're not transferring some of the older, you know, if it's the original 17, if it's out of 100%, 17%, somebody buys that new 17% and they're transferring another 17%, that's not 34%, that's still the 17% you transferred originally. But if you get to an aggregate of 50% plus one, yes, trigger a reassessment. Should properties um, used for commercial purposes be taxed differently than properties used for residential purposes? I want to follow the same 50% plus one rule. So the part of that is, right, we have to decide what we're going to do is, as to, right, there's other ways to transfer ownership, and that also includes uh, public equities, right, the, uh, you know, to the extent that today you can monitor that, right, aggregate it, or, and the alternative, uh, put a time frame. I'm not wedded to that, but I think we need to start putting some pressure so that we can fulfill the original intent. If you have a transfer of 50% plus one, you ought to trigger a reassessment. And so just uh, very basically, do you... There's a chance split roll might be on the ballot in November. Do you would you support that initiative? I would look at the details before I make a final determination. Okay. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to ask about um, SB 827, which is Senator Scott Weiner's bill that would mandate upzoning um, around uh, transit hubs. You've expressed opposition to that bill. Why do you oppose that bill? Uh, the I'd, I'd like to see more local input. I'd like to see. Uh, affordable housing uh, included. It's not that uh, I oppose uh, all those efforts to build more housing. I supported uh, the Senator's SB 35, uh, right, because we don't want local jurisdictions to put up roadblocks uh, to be recalcitrant in regard regards to ownership of what they need to do to build more affordable housing. I just think, uh, you know, SB uh, 827 right now is an unfinished product. It needs to fill in a, a few of those gaps uh, before uh, I would. What are the gaps? What, what needs well, to well, be I just, added to? I just mentioned a couple of them, right? Sorry. The, the, no no worries. The uh, right affordable housing inclusion, right? The you want some. So an, an inclusionary requirement. Uh, yes. Okay. The uh, and. Uh, some type of right, and also a menu of options, right? Not not everything is uh, should be open to uh, design that's not uh, contemplated in, in advance, right? If you're allowing your transit centers uh, things that don't fit in the character, I want character of the neighborhood. Uh, I don't know what that final process or plan looks like, but you you know I don't want a uh, I don't want something that, that is out of character of what people have done. Part of this is I also want contemplation of uh, communities, uh, local leadership, uh, their public leadership that have made sacrifices. There are those who went through the brutal process of trying to move forward, uh, and so I want that respected and recognized versus we have too many jurisdictions in this state that won't move on anything and them not being impacted uh, by SB 827 or something else in the process. We, we need everybody to be uh, responsible for making sure that we provide more housing uh, in this state. Hi, Hi. I, I'd like to ask you about the achievement gap. Yes. You mentioned uh, the achievement gap as a barrier to achieving the California dream. And right now, the state 
gives local districts a lot of flexibility to determine how to narrow that gap. What role should the state play in narrowing the gap under your administration? Yeah, we need to make sure that we're, uh, we hold those, uh, uh, those leaders uh, responsible uh, for their decisions, right? We have to make sure that there's measurable progress. Uh, we can't allow failure to continue. Uh, right, that failure continues uh, and exists today in regards to entrenched cycles of poverty. You know, the fact that, uh, you know, disproportionately high, even though we're near full employment in the state, 13 and a half million out of our 39.6 million Californians who use uh, Medi-Cal. Uh, and so, and part of this is, right, I don't, this may be part of the chicken or egg. We need to go back and start doing long-term studies. I know in the education community they're starting to do more of it. but. Uh, but for a long period of time, they weren't measuring to see what was taught in colleges of education and what's actually delivered in the classroom is actually effective teaching, right? So the, uh, you know, part of what I want to see driven is let's, let's make sure that we have evidence-based uh, decision-making uh, and we have to go back to, you know, our pedagogy and see is, is it actually prov providing the excellence uh, that we want to achieve. Sure. So those types of things sound like exactly the right idea, but they would take quite a while to do all of that study. So would there be anything done, you know, let's say you're governor for four years, what can be done in those four years to narrow the gap for the kids that are in school at that time? Yeah, no, we would be actively engaged uh, with those school districts that are underperforming. We want to see, you know, why they made those decisions, the, you know, how are they addressing specific instances, you know, what, what are, what are uh, some of the more pervasive factors uh, that uh, impact some of the larger populations within that particular school and school district. Uh, so, so you don't think the intervention at the state level right now is sufficient? The, uh, I, my, my style is always to make sure that we're very active. Okay. Yeah. And you mentioned food insecurity earlier. Um, I think you were speaking about the lower, um, lower grades. But how does how would you address food insecurity at the higher ed level, where many of our college students are? not able to eat. <laughs> yeah, they, I'd, I'd also talk to school site leadership. So uh, I think, a, I don't know, four to six weeks ago, I visited Imperial Valley College, which is on the United States-Mexico uh, border. It's 90% Latino, uh, visited with their administration. The student body is 90%, uh, as I said, Latino. Uh, and it was very interesting. They understand their student body composition very well. And I think they mentioned that there's I think the, uh, and I apologize if it's incorrect, I think it's 85 homeless students, right? So their student success counselors, and I like that title, right? I identify the particular needs of the student because they want to make sure that they succeed uh, in that particular, uh, at Imperial Valley College. And so part of this is, you know, they have food banks and other things. Uh, if, if that person is a student but is also responsible for other members of their family and there's nine mouths to feed, they'll pack like nine meals uh, to take care of them. So they're looking at students holistically. Uh, I think a lot of our efforts going forward have to take that type of approach. So food banks is a, a good example because that's the type of thing that's sort of addressing the problem that you are faced with on, on that day. But isn't the, the fact that so many of our students can't eat sort of indicative of a broader problem that college is just too expensive for our low-income students? And is there a solution to that sort of bigger picture? Yeah, so a, a couple of uh, responses. Uh, uh, number number uh, Number one, uh, I put out my higher education plan uh, last week. Uh, one of the provisions in financing that higher education plan is uh, Senate supporting uh, Senator uh, Schatz's uh, provision. Uh, he's a senator from the state of Hawaii where he wanted to see that college students graduate debt free. And so what he was providing and offering, uh, and I will do everything I can to make sure that effort is successful at the federal level, is to provide matching grants. Uh, that type of thinking is what's reflected in Imperial Valley College in regards to, it's just not tuition and fees, it's also housing costs, it's food insecurity. So bringing those types of provisions so what we can do. Uh, as an aside, I want more of the state's financing authorities, investment authorities to build student housing. Uh, use our resources, direct it. Uh, I try to use a lot of the resources in the treasurer's office into California activities. And then as a side, I visited also probably uh, four to six weeks ago, uh, Feeding San Diego. Uh, some of you know Vince Hall from his days during Gray Davis's uh, tenure, Deputy Chief of Staff under, uh, or working with Lynn Shank. 
Uh, so he now heads Feeding San Diego and right as he provides that there is sufficient food in the state uh, on a daily basis to feed everybody. It's the misallocation. So there are very intense efforts uh, through various organizations. So part of that has to be, right, how do we more fully grasp those opportunities? How do we build the relationships and connections so that students and others are not food insecure? Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Kind of education, you, you know, we're almost four years into the local control funding formula now. We spent well over $30 billion to try and close the achievement gap with this new tool. How is it working? Yeah, I, I think the results, right, we, we're going to have to continue uh, to track. Uh, part of the things is, right, there, there's uh, a lot of stories about those monies not actually being used in the classroom, right? Part of this is, let's go in if, <laughs> I'm sorry? We, we wrote some of them. Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, and I will give you credit. <laughs> the, uh, so, uh, as I pointed out earlier, right, most successful auditor in California history, uh, you know, I want money spent as what was it was intended to do because we need to achieve the results uh, that we were seeking uh, so right if you want to use it for other purposes I understand but let's have that conversation else right we can't comp we can't have you circumventing what we're trying to do so at the end of the day our I'm sorry David. districts do need to report how they're spending the LCFF money yeah, yes I and did you see the governor's recent proposal in his budget how he would change the reporting of that money is, is that satisfactory to you uh, they, I, I'd, ha I'd have to study it uh, so but I, I push for this right so when people raise the question will the dollars from props 30 be used for education right I put up a website the track prop 30 website uh, we encourage my successor and thank thank you to Betty for doing so, right? Because when they went back with Prop 55, even though it wasn't getting a lot of hits, right? All of you, right? The media were asking the question, you know, where, where are those monies going? And so that's why I wanted to make sure that we, we have that transparency. And it should be for everything, right? You know, when people legitimately raise, are you going to use those? Are they going to use the gas tax dollars for roadways? Uh, yes, you ought, you, we ought to guarantee that that's in fact the case, right? You can't keep violating the people's trust and go back to them, right? This this is a this needs to be our strongest connection in our democracy, and at, at too many times it's tenuous uh, because we we have not preserved that trust. Uh, and so a, a lot of a lot of my efforts are going to make sure that uh, because we're going to have to go back and you know ask big things of individuals, uh, right? There's uh, right things unfold and uh, people ha live different life circumstances, and so. You know, you're going to have to establish, well, you, you may not understand it now. You may not see the pathway in the future. But, you know, oftentimes past this prologue, look what I've tried to do in the past. So on LCFF, though, we're four years into it. Would you have expected to see more evidence of, uh, of improvement? Or are there signs, do you think, that it's working? Uh, any the, questions? You know, the, uh, we will continue to ask questions. Right, the, uh, m mine is... Uh, I think that many of you heard. I, you know, I got Judy's. Right, I got I got a tough Asian American mom. Right, yeah, they, uh, you know, she checked on results. So they, uh, it's gonna it's gonna bring that. It's uh, it's why Dave Jones said, uh, you know, at my inaugural, every time I see Mrs. Chung, I get beads of sweat pouring down my neck. Right, because my mom is gonna make sure that every every kid uh, that studied at my house performed. So they, uh, you know, that's that's my mom's my mom's legacy. I'm gonna make sure that uh, her son checks on kids' performances. And do you want to? Did you want to? Um, yeah, um, wildfires um, obviously are, are a particular problem in, in, in recent years. The Sierra is, is an issue. How do you propose to deal with that? Yeah, well, we know that climate change has uh, had a dramatic impact. Uh, right, you, I was down in Dinuba yesterday. Uh, uh, talking about the issues and you know if you look at uh, where our future looks right a lot of that uh, rich agricultural bounty is going to continue to move north as we have uh, change in in climate uh, patterns uh, we know that you know what was uh, infrequent now is more frequent you know the uh, the gust of uh, gale gale wind uh, when I visited a couple of times and did the uh, tour, tour uh, with uh, you know our, our emergency uh, personnel in the state with uh, the uh, speaker and other legislators. 
uh, it is not something that's going to be unexpected, right? The n number of nights where you had consistently above 50 miles an hour was dramatic, right? So we're going to have to invest in, in the front end in more preventative and security measures uh, going on. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we're going to have to talk to our federal partners in regards to a lot of that. A, a lot too much of our reaction is, you know, what do you do in the aftermath of these activities? Uh, we've talked about or they've talked about the fact that you know, they're concerned about future resources uh, that will be available to them when you have some type of emergency so that they won't use those monies for the preparation because they want to have it available. You know, part of that is a lack of trust, right? Well, it's a, one of the issues as it relates to the Sierra is, is whether to make greater use of, of um, logging, um, prescribed burns. I mean, what's your, what's your view of that? Uh, the, uh, we're going we're gonna to have to look at our forest management practices. Uh, you know, I will seek the, the professional, the academic, other experts, uh, bring together all the community groups uh, to make sure that, you know, we take care of this because uh, the damage is uh, fatal, right? Li lives, lives are being lost. Uh, and so, you know, what has happened in the past is no longer sufficient. Uh, so we're going to have to open up eyes, we're going to have to open up hearts, we're going to have to open up minds to come to resolution. Um, sea level rise, uh, uh, Noah just came out with a uh, big report on, on sea level rise as it affects San Diego in particular, but it's an issue in the Bay Area, up and down our coast. Um, what do you see as, as, as what California's reaction ought to be? Uh, so the, uh, I've worked on this uh, for years. Uh, right, you see uh, some of those estimates from a decade ago being 36 to 59 inches, right? And then you had some of the, the ones that are, have stated a more pronounced impact up to 10 feet uh, off the coast of California. One of the things that I pushed, uh, Julia Brownlee carried for me, was uh, I wanted local governments to evaluate uh, the impact of sea level rise on their infrastructure. Uh, part of the reason that it was slow going through the legislature is uh, local governments did, that many of them are in varying financial conditions, uh, so they didn't have the financial resources available to do those studies, right? But we need to make sure that we understand this is a state concern uh, and that we work together to evaluate uh, what needs to be done on its impact. Uh, at the State Lands Commission, uh, we worked on issues such as uh, off the coast of uh, Malibu, Malibu uh, the, the erosion taking place, right? There, because it's a wealthier community, they were able to pro provide, you know, put together their own financing district uh, to try to mitigate uh, some of that erosion or to delay some of that erosion. So we will look at different uh, tools. Uh, uh, understanding uh, where various co communities are in regards to how they want to handle these conditions to address going forward sea level rise. Can I interject a question, uh, John? Uh, this has to do with your great role, both State Land Commission and Treasury. Mm -hmm. A number of cities have been suing um, oil companies, saying that they're responsible for rising sea levels. And uh, there's all sorts of apocalyptic things that are going to happen in our community. But at the same time, they're omitting those apocalyptic uh, visions from their bond issues saying they don't expect any such thing. Have you looked into that at all? This, this bifurcation between what they're saying in one hand in their lawsuits and what they're saying in their bond issues on another, on another case? I would disclose. You what? I would disclose. You would disclose in their bond issues? Uh, they, uh, for, for, for us uh, in the uh, right, the, I'm, I'm the agent of sale for the state's debt. We recognize climate change as a uh, uh, as a factor, so. That could, however, make it very difficult for these communities to get long-term financing for their infrastructure if they had to say, however, we're under danger of going underwater or something to that effect. Is, it, is, this, a, is this a serious problem or is this just an artificial construct, this, this bifurcation between those two types of views? Well, it's a risk. It's a, a risk. Uh, the part of that ought to be the conversations with bond council and the credit ratings agencies. Uh, there's uh, what you want to do is you want to disclose so that your f investors are fully aware. Uh, and I would encourage people just uh, right because we all have SEC liability. Uh, you want to be upfront and honest. Uh, and so put it out there and right to the extent that it impacts a community more than others. Uh, 
then you can make the appropriate adjustment in your, uh, you know, your offering statement or your Appendix A. So, just one question about the tunnel. You, you, you oppose twin tunnel, tunnel, single tunnel, both of them? Uh, are they, uh, I am not there yet, right? The, they so passed what's the, the two alternative? Uh, well, we don't have one that fixes everything at the particular juncture, right? Obviously, we're going to have to go forward in regards to examining all the tools. Uh, you know, we know that a huge chunk of this state is, uh, you know, back in drought, even though that's why I appreciate the rain and I, they keep raining. Uh, one of the things that we have to do is uh, we have to implement better infrastructure. One of the things that I want to fully support, uh, not just in regards to water storage, is that the state uh, is not up to the 20, what our 21st, standard, 21st mm -hmm. standard practices ought to be in regards to identifying infrastructure, the condition of that infrastructure, how we're going to finance that infrastructure. Uh, so water would come under, uh, on the, yeah, water storage would come under that same, uh, uh, that same effort. Can would you I switch gears for a second here? I have a question about mental health. So we know that there is a serious issue statewide and it affects homelessness and other things. Would you support increasing or compelling mentally ill people to receive treatment or placing them in state facilities if they don't? We, we, we have to look at it, right? We're, we're at a crisis. Does look at it mean yes? Uh, look at it means the, I, I don't want to abridge the freedoms of those individuals, uh, but we, we have to do more so that people, right, the, we're opening up a little bit, the loved ones and others are reporting people who are in uh, those type of conditions. Uh, I don't know where the defining line is, uh, but what we have today is, uh, is not acceptable. The, the numbers are growing hand over, hand over fist. Uh, and so, you know, how we encourage the advocates, the representatives, uh, as to what they believe uh, we can do to bring people uh, into treatment uh, who, are in, who are in dire need uh, needs to be uh, revisited. Can I ask you about healthcare more broadly? Yes. Um, the, I think the uninsured rate is down to 7% at this point in California, but a big bulk of that population are un, undocumented immigrants. Is, is, that, is there a role for the state to play in ex, extending coverage to, to that population? Uh, it, yeah, in, in my value system, it would. Is, is there anything specifically that you would want the state to do to bring that population into? I, I put out my health care plan yesterday, so. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, it. okay. it's johnchong.com. <laughs> 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 we wanted to keep it simple. <laughs> we used to have other things, right? And people used to try to buy the other things. The, uh, right, the, uh, obviously, we want to be, make a progression. Uh, the, uh, I'm a supporter of uh, single payer, uh, so we're going to do what we can. My, my parents come from Taiwan, uh, so there's a culture of single payer. Uh, a couple months ago, I sat with the for foreign health minister because we know that the, you know, the atmosphere, the environment here, uh, versus the one in Taiwan is uh, very different. I want to make sure that we're financially responsible, that we're inclusive, uh, that we're going to get everybody to participate. Right? We know that the uh, the medical re reimbursement rates really discourage a lot of the providers from participating in our system. So, uh, right, we ha obviously, uh, and I think you guys have reported it. Well, you certainly know all of it. Right, there's going to be high hurdles uh, in a Trump administration. Uh, right, he's put up high hurdles to Republican administrations from other states. Uh, so they, uh, you know, I'm not foolish enough to think that uh, they're going to give us a, a first pass or it even happen uh, during. So you don't support SB 562. Or uh, I, I would, yeah, no, I would support 562 if amended to, you know, figure out how to pay for this and you know provide uh, more specifics about coverage and. Uh, of people and uh, extent of health healthcare coverage. Okay. Is there anything in the short term that the state could do to sort of overcome those hurdles? Yeah, build up public option. Public option. Yeah. Can I? I mean, you of all candidates know the pension mm -hmm. issue, both you know from the numbers perspective and and also labor's perspective. You know, and I'm wondering, you know, would you carry on Governor Brown's court fight to retain the right to modify? future benefits of current workers, the so-called California rule? I would continue uh, to have the difficult conversations uh, with the represented employees and others uh, to make sure that we try to continue. This, this is going to be a long time effort. Uh, 
you know, this is a system that was built uh, in a very different era, um, right? One where those numbers were easy to achieve, uh, and we know that that's no longer the investment market. And so how do you reset expectations among those who negotiate, those who receive, uh, those who are providing, uh, and try to get to a place, right? The, uh, you know, I think there's, it's the common sentiment at uh, CalPERS, right, to drop the discount rate, uh, right? There's that friction with how we try to drop the discount rate uh, because you have some cities that have stronger financial wherewithal and plenty who do not. So when we say we want to drop the discount rate, you know, from you know, seven and three quarters, seven and a half to seven and a quarter. And right, the, during that time of the financial crisis, you have multiple jurisdictions saying, you know, you will shove us into bankruptcy volitional, volitionally uh, and exacerbate uh, the deterioration of uh, California holistically's health, right? Uh, so we want to take risk off the table. Frankly, that will create short-term pressure on the board, but I think over the long term, right, it gets everybody to a place where we can uh, build a model that's more sustainable, that uh, the parameters of our risk are more contained. But what I'm hearing is you're saying go do it through collective bargaining. Don't necessarily fight it in the Supreme Court. I prefer to do it through collective bargaining. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just, it, you know, the governor has talked about the recession is out there, it's looming, and the next governor will likely inherit some, something, some darkness. Um, what, what, besides the rainy day fund, what are some things that you would make California's budget recession proof? Uh, I would, uh, well, first of all, we have that conversation early on, right? I think this clearly demonstrates my approach that's different than the others, right? So early on in my tenure as state controller, some of you remember I started posting on a monthly basis the state's revenues, disbursements, the state's cash position. So Jen, Sorry, July 13th, 2007, the state goes into a negative cash position, right? The real estate market is not tanking, the recession had not officially begun, and we don't have the financial crisis. But I was trying to warn others in Sacramento, right, our finances are not healthy because how do we get into a negative cash position? People didn't listen, right? Unlike others, if given the extraordinary honor of being governor, right, when the moment I see that, I'm calling everybody in. Right, because I said, we're not going to let it get worse so that our problems are larger. Right? If something's happening with our income or if we miscalculated outflows on expenditures, right, we need to check it now. The, uh, and frankly, right, when you share the pain earlier, the pain is less. You're going to have a lot of griping. But I'm going to remind people, right, we eliminated services entirely because we didn't react until the end. Uh, so that's frankly how uh, I would be very different than the others, right? In contrast, um, look what the others did, right? The others, a couple of the other major candidates, San Francisco, he left that city $380 million in debt, right? Ratings report, structural imbalances, right? One-time gimmicks. The, uh, you know, same thing in the city of Los Angeles, right? The, I rather have the upfront difficult conversations now and you know and it's a test of metal right who's willing to do the things that aren't popular right you know people said oh John attacked Governor Schwarzenegger right the on the minimum wage right because he's a Democrat right but it's also right you know it, Democrats were complaining not about that part but the fact that I challenged Governor Schwarzenegger because it was also a le the legislature's budget that they pushed on right and you know proposition 25 Right, I didn't pay the legislature, right? Still to this day, I don't have endorsements from Democrats or I get attacked by Democrats because I didn't pay them, right? I said, you can't ke keep passing. Technically, you may win the court case, but you guys have never argued that your numbers were correct. Because at the end of the day, we have to pay real people with real money, right? I will get criticized by a lot of people. John, why don't you run deficits? Why don't you print money? Because printing and the money in the state of California is called IOUs and they come with a high price, right? They come with 3.75% that we were paying where people weren't even getting 0.5, right, from their bank accounts. So it sounds like you're saying, you know, you'd call for a special session to reopen the budget mid-year if, if need be, if the numbers are, okay. Thank yeah. you. Would you drop the, the 
governor's appeal of the pension? Uh, I, I continue to look at it, right? I want to have com conversations about how we press forward and negotiate this. Okay. But would you drop it? Uh, the, uh, I will look at it at time. Right? The, I, I, I want to have everything. I'm going to look at all tools available. I, I just wonder how big of a problem you think this is. I mean, obviously it's big numbers, but um, and uh, we've seen cities talk about bankruptcy, but or concerns about it. But um, how big of a problem is it? Uh, for many, this is a very, very serious issue, right? We have cities that are unable uh, to make their payments, uh, and uh, they are reneging on their promise for to their employees who've worked, right? And, and in addition to pensions, right? And in regards to approach, uh, remember, I was the one who, d and I was required to, but I did that study earlier than required on healthcare liabilities, right? I did the OPEB obligation and. You were here for a long time. I was the only person saying we need to start paying this because this is going to grow into a significant liability. Uh, and you know, the people up here were saying, "John, be quiet. You know, don't talk about it." Um, mine is you don't you don't build up that debt uncontrollably because I want to retire my have my golden years in California and I want to live in a vibrant financially healthy economy, right? I believe in education, right? The I don't want that money going to pay for interest, unfunded obligations. I want us investing in education, healthcare, job creation. And, you know, the very fact, uh, you know, unfortunately has unfolded. Uh, I give credit to Governor Brown for tackling, uh, starting to tackle that issue, uh, right? He was trying to work on pensions in addition to it. Uh, but in my first year when I did that study, $32 billion obligation over a 30-year period of time, but because we did minimum on the credit card, $47.88 billion. When I left office eight years later, $72 billion obligation. Today, after Betty disclosed that obligation, right, a, a month or two months ago, over a $90 billion obligation. Uh, that's, that's not what we want. Um, changing gears, I wanted to ask about the death penalty. It's something that California voters have consistently expressed support for. Executions have been on hold for a while, but you know they could resume at any time. The Supreme Court upheld Prop 60, and they could uh, resume at any time. So what would you do when an execution is scheduled in your governor? Uh, I would fully uh, evaluate all the facts and s circumstances and law uh, before me. Uh, I am personally opposed to the death penalty, um, uh, but the, uh, you know, I don't thwart the will of the voters. Uh, the, but, uh, you know, I also want to make sure that, uh, you know, on my conscience, since that uh, somebody didn't lose their life, uh, you know, with, without clear conviction and understanding that this person uh, might not have caused, uh, you know, what, what was he, he was found guilty of. He so would she. you use your power to stay in execution as governor? Uh, I will look at all the facts and circumstances and determine if it, I deem it appropriate. Okay. Um, completely different issue, but you know, having to do with campaign transparency. Um, normal part of the process that candidates go out and seek endorsements from all kinds of groups. Many of them, most of them, almost all of them are groups that then have business before um, the legislature and the governor in the process of policy making. Um, I have asked all the major candidates to share with me the endorsement questionnaires that you've completed. Um, I've emailed your campaign several times. I've not heard a response from them or from you, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to ask you if you're willing to you know, share with the public the answers that you're sharing with the interest groups that have, from whom you've sought the endorsement. Uh, I will answer any question you have, that, you know, or the questions that you post here. I'm not going to disclose the questionnaires that uh, we've completed, uh, right? If I had that understanding, right, it's their questionnaire uh, that I could disclose it at, you know, they, I, I didn't, I don't, uh, I, I wouldn't do it, but that wasn't my understanding as I filled those questionnaires. But it's your answer and it's you're the running for public office. Why shouldn't the voters know what, what answers you are giving these interest groups? Uh, they, uh, as I said, I'm open to taking questions from individuals as they pose them, so. So you're not going to share them with the public? 
uh, they, I'm not going to share people's private questions or questionnaires with the public, right? They, I, I get uh, asked quite quite a few questions on a on a daily basis. So, on the subject of disclosure, um, there's a legislative proposal to ban non-disclosure agreements in legal settlements relating to sexual misconduct. Um, would you support that? Ban? Yes. You would. Yeah, I'm the only candidate uh, in this campaign who has proposed a. Uh, you know, a specific plan. Uh, you know, I think we need to change the culture, uh, whether it's in Hollywood, the Silicon Valley, or are we across the street, uh, <laughs> city halls, uh, right? And you know, we we need to take we need to take it seriously. You know, if people abuse their power and privilege, and you know, we are we, we're afforded an extraordinary responsibility. Right? You, you have constitutional rights to ask your questions. We hold these positions by virtue of the United States and California Constitution. Uh, uh, we we, we want to make sure that, uh, right, we, if uh, somebody abuses that privilege, that, then make it clear they're unfit to serve. Where are you on cash bail? Do you, do you support? I think we need reform. We need reform. So, I mean, replacing it entirely with? Uh, yeah, I'm open to it. Yeah, I want to make sure that we, uh, we evaluate the security risk. Uh, part of this is uh, we need further deliberations. I met with the uh, presiding judge of uh, 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 the LA courts uh, and some other judges, their staffs. Uh, right, that that would require significant work and effort. Um, and so, you know, people were talking about yes, philosophically, we we like the idea, but what would that actually require, and what does that require throughout the state? And are we willing to make that a priority? Uh, obviously, we don't want to support an idea and not back it up uh, with the ability to achieve that goal. Um, on, on the question of, of police shootings, mm -hmm. I'm wondering if the, should the state play a more active role in ensuring that investigations into, um, into those incidents are conducted fairly and thoroughly? Well, the, the governor and the legislature uh, has to set the tone. Uh, we need to evaluate uh, what's happening with our police practices. Uh, and because, uh, yes, uh, the advocates, uh, the law enforcement organizations, uh, the faith community, uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, others uh, all advocate uh, before state government. Uh, and this is part and parcel our community and our state. We need to exercise leadership. So. We need to evaluate police training uh, and not trying to be critical of law enforcement uh, destructively, right? The, we, we want law enforcement officials to be the strong partners uh, with the people that they serve. So how do we recruit? Where do we recruit? How do we train? Are they trained so that they can be successful, right? The de-escalation process is I know the fear, right? I took a, when I was at Imperial Valley College, I took a, did a 10-minute segment on administration of justice and right, you know, the situations that law enforcement personnel are trying to go go through to making sure that they have the tools that they have to be successful. And then part of this is right. We, why we have a a revisit with every issue is that we there's not a clear understanding in the public about what's happening and why we're failing. And so we need to have real deep and the. Uh, uh, conversations that I, I think haven't penetrated the public consciousness. Part of the reason the public doesn't know what's happening is that all of those police personnel records are completely um, secret. There is no requirement in state law to disclose anything about them. Is that something you think should be changed? Uh, I think it, it, we, the, uh, we, we need to continue to have, uh, we need to have a, a healthy discussion about that, right? You have people who are passionate on both sides, uh, so part of this is you know what is best in the public interest. Uh, you know what type of disclosure would meaningfully provide the information the public needs and restore its public trust, yet pr protect uh, you know whatever important privacy needs there are for law enforcement. But uh, clearly, what's happening is uh, not restoring or promoting. Uh, administration of justice practices uh, that are resolving too many of the un, uh, too many of the uh, the uh, disturbing incidents that are happening so would you push for legislation to o open up the records and, and make them um, 
disclosable? I would continue cases? to push uh, what's starting to happen across the street to bring, as I said earlier, all the parties together about the real conversation, what is required in regards to making sure that we pursue justice in regards to what is the great standards, uh, the best standards for accountability in our system. Do you support the idea of the state getting involved if there's a police shooting at the local level? Does the state have a role? Should the state automatically take over the investigation or be part of the investigation? So I think there's appropriate uh, avenues or appropriate times when the state uh, should get involved, right? The, where you have, where you don't have that trust, where up here you wanted an independent authority, right? So let's make sure that we put in a framework by which we can have the state when you don't have, when people believe that that system will work uh, in local government. So we're coming to the end of, end of our time, and, um, but I want to just ask, how, how's the race going? Uh, how do you see yourself breaking through? What's the path to November? Yeah, very exciting. Uh, Right, it's uh, 60 something days, and so uh, the volatility will start in a right two to four weeks. Uh, you know, the, we will see how others are going to try to define me and all, all these other things. The, uh, uh, we, we made substantial progress, right? We're second in fundraising, uh, so we're going to be able to cover a whole host of markets. Uh, I have greater favorables relative to negatives than many of the other candidates. Uh, we all well know my challenge is uh, to build name identification, right? So as we build our name identification, uh, uh, you know, others are going to try to chop it down. But, you know, we have, we've picked up strong validators in different communities, widespread support. I mean, for example, you know, the, whether it's uh, Linda Sanchez, who's in the House leadership, Mark DeCano, some of the labor unions, some of the local elected officials focusing on housing issues, right? We picked up like the San Mateo mayor. You know, people in Northern California who are uh, experiencing within their local communities, right? We have good conveyors of people who are going to say, you know, John's actually worked on this issue, and that's what separates his leadership from others, right? People will make promises. But what's different is that, you know, in, in the era of President Trump, we need people who are going to do more than tweet, uh, right? Look at the record of, you know, President Trump, and you talk about housing, right? What have the other candidates done specifically on housing? Right? You know, people were sitting on the sidelines when they're going after private activity bonds. Right? You can promise everything that you're going to do on housing, and if he wipes out access to 66% of your financing for affordable housing, you don't understand the playing field. Right? You don't know how to step up to President Trump. Right? People may be promoting single payer, but you know, President Trump's attacking Obamacare. And so who came up with the idea for lifeline clinics? Right? He's not going to do anything as kids get gunned down in schools, right? I'm pushing at CalPERS, you know, uh, you know, divestment from the companies who won't ban, uh, who are supplying, you know, banned military-grade assault weapons, right? They and right and and people have caught up, right? And these are mainstream institutions, right? When Citigroup, a big Wall Street bank, sign, you know, agrees, you know, to that very notion uh, on the manufacturers, when you got. Delta Airlines willing to take on, you know, the people in Georgia, uh, the legislature, right? It's become widespread. And so at the end of the day, uh, you know, if you look at my history and polls, right, the, you know, as people close and review the record, they want somebody that has integrity, they want somebody who has trust, they want somebody who has a record of fiscal responsibility. That's why I'm the Democrat who wins in more moderate areas. Mm -hmm. The only Democrat who won Fresno. Right, Henry Prey had told me that I, I wasn't tracking all that stuff. Right, barely won, but I won. Right, proud. <laughs> yeah. Right, uh, Jerry Brown and I are the Democrats who won in San Diego. In my statewide races, I've never lost San Diego. So you'll have progressive Republicans who care about the environment. We talk about oil drilling, but who want somebody who's not going to throw California into an irresponsible spending spree, leaving your city or state with massive financial deficit. Will you have enough money to get your message out? Do you think? Uh, yes. Well, we could always use more, <laughs> right? The uh, right in, in the in these campaigns, uh, right? You know, the the question is, uh, you know, do you want to reach out to somebody twenty times, or do you want to reach out to somebody uh, one hundred and twenty times? Mm -hmm. So obviously, you'd love to have that opportunity to, you know, it takes quite a few. It's a, and you just don't want to say, you know, I'm talking about housing or fiscal responsibility, you know, or education, right? You want to say, you know, I am, I'm not one issue, right? You know, what I try to build is. You know, I said at the outset, I want a state that everybody understands that they're valuable, 
This is a socially inclusive state. We're California, and this is the state uh, that uh, my parents would have imagined what, what, what they did imagine about America, right? The single best plot of land where you're gonna fulfill your future is America. And right, the, uh, I, get, uh, I get territorial, right? The, uh, some of you see the, uh, you know, when people pick on California, right, sort of like that big brother I was when people were beating up on my little brother and sister, the, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna defend this state, uh, but more importantly, I'm gonna make sure that we are the best so that uh, you know, people will look up to us. Thank you very much yeah. for your time. It's much Thanks, appreciated. David. Thank it's you. very good to see you. Thank you. And welcome to Cal Malley. Thank you. Yeah, my thank you. 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 Thank you.